What is wisdom? When we look at the book of James, uh, as we overviewed it in the student ministry, as at the very beginning, we, we noted that the book of James, uh, in a lot of ways, is a, is a parallel account or a similar account to the book of Proverbs. Uh, it is just filled with wisdom. It is filled with instruction and imperatives and truth on, on how to live faithfully. So that question comes up often. As we work through the book, as we think about our lives as believers, what is wisdom? You could ask, how should we think about wisdom? What do you know about wisdom? What is it? How should we think about it? What do you know about it? It's interesting uh, when we look at the scriptures that wisdom has such a large amount of uh, references in the scriptures. Uh, wisdom, the, the word wisdom, the understanding of wisdom comes up so often. And yet, uh, it can be so challenging at times to understand. Some of you guys may say, oh, I know, I have a, I have a very clear understanding of what wisdom is. And some may say, I'm, I'm not sure. If, if someone were to ask me what wisdom was or is, I would, I would, I would be challenged to come up with a definition did you know that to be wise is something that we are commanded in the scriptures? You know, the scriptures actually, they tell us that we ought to be wise. Listen to Ephesians 5. It says this, Be very careful then how you walk. Live not as unwise, but wise. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, he commands them to be wise. Did you know that wisdom is more valuable than riches? Wisdom is more valuable than riches. Proverbs 16, 16 says this, How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. So interesting. There's something that we should take note of as we think of uh, wisdom regarding this truth. Uh, the, the, the scriptures would teach that wisdom is more valuable than gold. And yet, we don't often spend much time thinking about it. If, if, if the scriptures are true, which they are, and, it, and, and Solomon, writing in the, Proverb, in the book of Proverbs, says that wisdom is more valuable than gold, it, it, it should be noted that that is something that we should value. We should spend time thinking through wisdom. When I think about wisdom, one of the first thoughts that comes to my mind is discipleship. When I, when I think about wisdom and I think how is it happening, what does it look like, what are the avenues and windows in which it comes into the lives of God's people, one of the first things that comes to my mind is discipleship. Wisdom is one of the immediate blessings that comes in discipleship and is one of, one of the main reasons it's such a common conversation in the body. It's such a common uh, conversation. It's actually spoken about and commanded. Uh, when we think about uh, Titus 2 and we have these commands of, hey, go teach these younger people. There's this picture of, hey, I'm further down the road than you. Come with me. Let me bring you up to speed. Let me catch you up to where I am. In a day and age where independence and self-reliance are at the top of the food chain, believers have this opportunity to be different. We have this opportunity to be set apart because we have been called to seek discipleship, to seek understanding, to seek wisdom in contrast to that self-reliant, prideful human. The believer says as he seeks discipleship and wisdom and counsel, I recognize this, that I don't have it all figured out. I recognize that. Right? It, it takes humility for someone to come to the conclusion that they need wisdom. What would be the opposite of that? Someone who is prideful. Someone who depends on their own strengths. Someone who depends on, on everything that they have been given, everything that they have. When they think about wisdom, it is not important to them. Why? Because someone who does not long for wisdom doesn't long for wisdom because they think 
that they have arrived. If, if I were to pose the question and raise my hand, how many of you guys would say, and I'm not going to actually ask you to raise your hand, but think about it. What if I said, raise your hand if you think you've arrived. If you have just, if you have come to the conclusion that you have it all figured out, you know everything that there is to be needed, you know all things, you do all things, you are ultimately perfect. And there's no more learning left for you. And, and, and it's such a, 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 a truth that until, and, and honestly, even after death, we are still going to be learning about the glorious Savior that we have. So you think about this. There is no point in this life. There's no point in this life where someone would come to you and say, well, at least they shouldn't. I've, I've got it. I've got it all figured out. I, I, I don't need help. I don't need counsel. I don't need wisdom. I don't need truth poured into my life. I've, I've, my cup is full. In this room right now, we have some that are trying to figure out what they do when they graduate. And we may have some in this room who are trying to figure out where they should celebrate their 80th birthday. There are men and women who have been faithfully serving the Lord as mothers and fathers for years and there are husbands and wives trying to figure out how to live with one another and how to live with another sinner. And at the root of the question is, how do I live faithful to God in this life? When I think about wisdom, when we look at wisdom, how do I live this life? How, do, how can I be faithful in this life? And with that being said, I wish that I could just say, oh, go read this book or speak to uh, any person who is uh, over the age of 60 and they'll be able to answer all of the questions for you. Unfortunately, being advanced in years doesn't just grant automatic wisdom. The wisdom that we are talking about, as James will, then, will, will soon communicate to us, it comes from above. The wisdom that we are talking about, it comes from above. And... With that being said, there is another type of wisdom. There is another type of wisdom that does not come from above, and it is worldly wisdom and is counterfeit. All of this is what we are going to be looking at tonight. When we think about wisdom, here's what we're going to be looking at tonight. In this section, James is going to teach his audience how to identify wisdom and then instruct them in the difference between godly wisdom and and worldly wisdom. I'm going to say that again. In this section, James is going to teach his audience how to identify wisdom. And then he's going to instruct them in the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. So our, our timeless truth for tonight. This is the, if you remember one thing about anything that comes out of my mouth tonight, that it would be this. This is, this is the heart of the matter. The source of your wisdom is evident in your walk. The source of your wisdom is evident in your walk. Wisdom of the world promotes oneself, but wisdom from above displays a life upright and good. Wisdom of the world promotes oneself, but wisdom from above displays a life upright and good. So our structure for tonight, we're going to see three lessons on wisdom. Three lessons on wisdom. Uh, the first one is, where is wisdom weighed? Where is wisdom weighed? The second is, what is wisdom of the world? What is wisdom of the world? And the third lesson is, what is wisdom from above? Pretty simple, right? Three points. Where is wisdom weighed? What is wisdom of the world? And what is wisdom from above? So before we jump in, I want to bring you up to speed, right? A lot of you guys have not been uh, pressing on through the book of James, starting in chapter 1, verse 1. And some of you, this is your first time uh, in chapter 3. And so to kind of give you the 10,000 foot view of James, chapters 1 through 3, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is writing to believers of the dispersion. And so he's writing to these believers who are, who are, in the, who are spread abroad, who are in the midst of a challenging time. 
The book itself has, and I said this, has, very, uh, has many similarities to the book of Proverbs. Uh, it is heavy with imperatives or commands, uh, and it is filled with instructions on how one ought to live. It, the book of James is filled with instruction in how one ought to live, and how one ought to think, and how one ought to act. As we go through chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see James speaks on trials. He speaks on wisdom from above uh, and, and how to receive it. Uh, he speaks on being a doer of the word. Uh, then he teaches on, in chapter 2, partiality and favoritism. Partiality and favoritism. Uh, and then transitions at the end of chapter 2 to the, true, the truth of faith and what that, that true faith produces ultimately works. That if you are truly in Christ, that your life will show it. And then most recently, the first uh, section that we've been in in the chapter 3 has been taming the tongue. And we've been there for the last three weeks. You guys were there for session 1 uh, in taming the tongue. And we learned a lot of things. We learned that the tongue itself is very powerful. Uh, James speaks about the tongue uh, in the way that uh, one ought to fear it. That we should think about our tongue as something that is extremely dangerous. One of the things we brought out in the student ministry would be like that of a loaded gun. Uh, people don't just throw a loaded gun around. They don't just throw it in their backpack like there's nothing significant or important. Uh, you wouldn't just throw it on your kitchen table with your kids eating dinner with you. You treat a loaded gun with respect. You treat it with the, the respect that it is due because you know what it is able to do. And James, for uh, about 17 verses, no, 12 verses, just lays out this understanding of the tongue is powerful. The tongue is so powerful. And, 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 and it is like a, a small spark that can then ultimately cause a huge forest fire. It is like a small rudder of a ship that has this ability to turn and maneuver a massive boat. It's like a, a bit that goes into the horse's mouth. And that one little bit is able to control this massive horse. So the tongue, yet it is so small. It is so powerful. And so we ought to consider our words. We ought to speak intentionally. We ought not use careless words. Uh, we, oftentimes we would reference the book of Matthew where Jesus says that you will, everyone will give account for every careless word spoken. And so when we think about the tongue, that it is powerful. So to overview the, the last three chapters that we've been looking at, uh, and all this you see, and you're going to see this continue through the book of James, is that James is teaching these believers on multiple areas of their lives. And it seems like James is, he's seeking to disciple the believers he is writing to and to bring them up in the faith. He's writing to young believers and it's just, oh, you need to learn about wisdom here. You need to learn about trials here. You need to learn about uh, your tongue here. And there's just like the picture after picture after picture of James seeking to encourage and edify and train them and instruct them and what does it look like to be faithful? What does it look like to be a believer? So that's your thousand foot view. So that being said, lesson number one, where is wisdom weighed? Where is wisdom weighed? And here in this section, we're going to see James set a foundation for the section that goes uh, against natural expectations of how we would think about wisdom. Uh, it's going to be contrasting to what we might often think of wisdom. And so I'm going to read verse 13 again. Who among you is wise in understanding? Let him show his good behavior. Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So he starts off with this question. And in this first lesson, James is going to ask this question and then gives a surprising answer to the question. So he asks a question, then he answers it. And the first, the question that he says is, who among you is wise and understanding? Who among you is wise and understanding? And we all know the answer to that question, right? We all know exactly what comes to our minds when James asks this question. Who among you is wise and understanding? The first thing that comes to our mind is, oh, the Pharisees. Or the scribes, those guys that they sit in the corner and they read through the, the old ancient scrolls all the time. The scholars, the smart guys, the ones that are over there discussing the Hebrew, the, the reason why there's a Y-Ik-Tol in the book of Psalms and not in the Proverbs. 
They have glasses. They carry themselves with their chest out and they walk around with calculators in their hands. Those are the wise and understanding. And, there's, and you, you just naturally have this picture of, you, you guys, you can, you can envision it. You're like, oh, that's, it's those, those people. The, the geniuses of the world. The, the intellectuals. That's, that is what we view as wise. And James quickly confronts that thinking. And he says this. To contrast that, he answers the question with something that is surprising as he mentions what this wisdom will look like. And he, it's, you'll notice, he doesn't reference calculators once. And I know, you're like, there's no way. That has to be the wise. This is what James says. Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Instead of, oh, it's the intellectual. Instead of anything that has anything to do with what every person knows and the amount of knowledge that one has in their mind, James says he is the one with good behavior. The one with good behavior. The one who is wise and understanding, let him show it. He's ultimately, he's saying, prove it by your good behavior that he has deeds and gentleness of wisdom. And it's surprising. That, that is a surprising answer to the question. James says, look at their walk to show their wisdom. Look at their walk. Who is wise? Let's look at their life. Let's time out for a second and set a definition for wisdom. Uh, you've likely heard this before, but when we think about wisdom, wisdom can be understood as applied knowledge. It's, it's applied knowledge or the knowledge that is wielded or knowledge with skillful use. Wisdom is insight to the will of God coupled with understanding on how it is applied to the life of a believer. Now, I think a helpful picture when I think about wisdom is like that of a sword. Like that of a sword. I I, I can come and I can give you a sword and it can be beautiful. It can be, you know, six feet long. It can be super sharp. It can have this really cool bevel to it. It can have diamonds in it. The, the stock of this sword can have a really, t a, like, like a nice tea candle. And I can give that to you. But if you don't know how to use a sword, it is useless to you. Like you might be able to cut an orange tree down in your backyard, but frankly, you are not going to be able to use this sword with any skill because learning how to use a sword is something that is learned. And so when we think about wisdom, wisdom is not just having a huge head. Wisdom is not just, oh, I know a lot of good things. Wisdom is the understanding. It's, it is the knowing a lot of things. It is understanding the scriptures but then it's the, the skillful use then of it. Wisdom is the application of the truth that you know. I can have a sword and it can be really cool. But to be wise with it would be, would be for me to be a master with that sword. And I can fight and I can, I don't, what's it, I don't even know what it's called. Fence. I can fence with said sword and I can do whatever it is. And I can go to battle with it. And that, that is something that, I, that is not just going to be natural. It's something that is going to be given to me. It's something that I'm going to, to learn. And so when we look at wisdom, it's not just this, this inflated mind of, I know, man, I can, I can tell you what Psalm 47, what the third verse means right now without even having to go look at there. No, it, when we think about wisdom, it's this understanding of, no, I know the truth. And I know then how to apply it to my life and to the life of those who are around me. So, the wise one is to show it. How? By his good behavior. James is telling them ultimately to prove it. Who is wise among you? Prove it. Show me by your good behavior. Prove your wisdom through your good behavior. Through your deeds in gentleness. If you are wise, you are living a life that is mature. If someone is wise, their life is going to be marked by an intentional, skillful, mature walk. Because the truth that they have has affected them in such a way 
that it has sanctified them and changed them and equipped them to live this life. Your behavior, the way you carry yourself, will be upright. Not only will your behavior be good, but you will be marked by gentleness. And we'll stop there uh, for the first lesson. This, this section's main thrust is, is specifically to highlight where and how we can identify if someone is wise. And so the, the answer is not what does said wisdom look like, but it's how do we identify it? Where do we see it? Where, where can we weigh if someone is wise? And the answer to the question is wisdom is weighed in your walk, not just your brain. Wisdom is weighed in your walk, not your brain. The wise walk in wisdom. Your steps will be marked by wisdom. Lesson number two. What is the wisdom of the world? If we can identify wisdom in the walk of those who are around us, if we identify wisdom in the behavior of those who are around us, what is wisdom of the world? This is what we don't want. And here we're going to see what the marks of said counterfeit wisdom is. What are the marks of counterfeit wisdom? Follow along as I read verses 14 uh, through 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. So now that James has uh, explained what we can be looking for to identify wisdom, he gives a couple marks of what wisdom from above doesn't look like. What does wisdom from above not look like? Uh, and he kind of contains it in these two, these, two, these two understandings. One is bitter jealousy, and the second one is selfish ambition. And when we think about bitter jealousy, bitter jealousy at its core is selfishness. Bitter jealousy at its core is selfishness. It's seeking the best for self, wanting the best for self. And this is at the expense of others, wanting what they have. Jealousy, it's, it's, that, it's that envy or it can be covetousness. It's, it's I want that. I want what that person has. But this, this bitter jealousy is marked by self-worship. It's seeking the best for self. And then... To, to sandwich right on top of that, we have selfish ambition. Selfish ambition, this is to care most about the person in the mirror. To care about the wants you have above all. To care about numero uno. It's to care about the agenda you have for yourself above all. Selfish ambition is to care about yourself and the things that you want, your ambitions, your desires. You could say your lust. And so these two understandings, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, can be combined, and they're equal marks of someone who is not longing to live a life of sacrifice and service, but one who is longing to be served. It is someone who wants to be served above all. And in the rest of this clause, uh, James says, these are in your heart. These are in your heart. Look at this. Look at verse 14 with me. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart. For those who live with jealousy and selfish ambition in their heart, they are worshiping an idol. To, to be motivated by selfish ambition is to worship an idol. They're worshiping the idol of self. And I know what you guys are thinking. It sounds bad. It sounds bad when we talk about someone worshiping an idol, worshiping the idol of self. But we would do well to realize that we are very capable of this. We are very capable of this. Uh, to be a self-worshipper is our native tongue. It's where we come from. All of us. We were, we were born this way. We are born longing to worship self. We are born with a sin nature. When we think back on our lives and the decisions that we have made and the sins that we have committed against others, it's likely rooted, rooted at the heart of the matter has been and, and was 
selfish ambition in our hearts. And it's so easy for us to respond with anger or harshness towards others when they are not most worried about what we want. That's what selfish ambition is. My agenda is by far the most important thing on this planet. And so either you get on the train, you support my ambitions, or you are my enemy. That's what it looks like. To, to, to worship yourself is to say that I am God. I deserve glory. I deserve honor. I, des I deserve service. I deserve everything. I deserve to be at the top. I deserve the most. I deserve the best. I deserve the first. To be a self-worshipper is our native tongue. Proverbs 18.2 says this, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. It's just this picture of what you have to say, it's not that important. What I have to say is important. And James says in verse 15, This wisdom is not that which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. It says earthly, natural, and demonic. That is to say that this type of wisdom, this type of life, is the norm for those who are natural and who are worldly. That type of life, the one who lives for the sake of themselves, for jealousy, for selfish ambition, that is to say someone is worldly and natural in their minds. Here are a couple ways that we can, or this type of sin can, and can creep into our lives. Entitlement. Entitlement. You deserve this. You deserve this. This is, this is, this is what you have earned. You should get that. They shouldn't have that. You deserve that. Another way that selfish ambition can, can creep its way into your life is through pride. You are the best. Oh, man, you are, you are so good at what you do. You are, if, if there was someone who is really good, you would make them not look good. You are so good at what you do. You are the best. You deserve to be known. People should know you as the best. People should know that what you do, when you do it, is by far better than everyone else, even that person over there. You are the best, and you deserve the best. Arrogance, another way that this can creep in is through arrogance. Those people, they don't understand. They don't understand what is right. They don't understand you. Listen, you are, you are just the best thing since sliced bread. And, it, and that's, that's what it, that is what is at the core of our hearts. When we allow selfish ambition to creep in, we are serving ourselves. We are worshiping the idol of self. We are, we are longing for the praise of man. That is just a couple. There are so many other ways that these things can creep in. And so that being said, James then he, he defines or he explains this type of wisdom as being demonic. What do we know about the demons? Let's think about this. They are fallen angels that chose to rebel against their creator to serve themselves. They chose to rebel against their creator to serve themselves. When you are living like this, when you are living a life that is marked by the wisdom of the world, when you are living a life that is marked by selfish ambition, you are following the prince of the power of the air. And I, I want to time out, and, and I want to take a second and, and really draw this out, because the reality is that wisdom is not communicated to you in that same way, right? Go, go to a public school, go to your workplace, go to any political realm, any educational realm, any business mindset, and when selfish ambition or pride and self-reliance is being communicated, do you think anyone is going to say, and listen, that's demonic. That is rebellious against your creator. No. No, no one is being fed a lie that is labeled, hey, this is what the demons did. Worldly wisdom is wrapped up, and it is so pretty. It has this beautiful bow, and it's so polished, 
and it's subtle, right? You deserve that. You are really good at what you do. And, and there's, this, there's this, this, this lie that gets fed, and we, and we allow it in. We allow it to creep in that says, I deserve this. I must worship this idol. I must serve this idol. And James is saying, that, that wisdom is not which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Listen, to not submit yourself to the wisdom that is from above, to not live a life that is in line with the scriptures, to not live a life that is in obedience to Christ is earthly, it is worldly, it is natural, and it is demonic. Because it is to rebel against the God who created you. We were all created by God. Every one of us. And we are all, because of him, created for a purpose. Ultimately, his glory. We were created to obey. Now, we may not, and we may not say, oh, well, I, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not held accountable to that. But we are. We were created by God to obey God. And so for us to, in contrast to obedience, in contrast to submitting to his will, in contrast to submitting to his word, for us to pursue selfish ambition is to rebel against our creator. It is demonic. It is to do what we want. It is an idol worship. It is to worship the idol in our heart. To be worldly wise is to be worldly and to be a rebel. As we transition, uh, the wisdom from the world, simply put, is no good. It says that you can get what you want, you can do what you want, you can live how you want, you can do whatever you want. Categorically, we all know this. We all know what this looks like. And we've all been here. If you are in Christ... Look back at before the Lord saved you. You were motivated by selfish ambition. If you are not in Christ, this is where you are. There are people who are close to me that think like this. And I'm sure we could go around the room and, and give examples of, of what does it look like to be living, living according to selfish ambition. This is someone who run who runs and runs and runs after the next idol. They run and run and run after the next lie of satisfaction that will ultimately lead them to emptiness. We see it all the time. Uh, Solomon says it like this, it is like those who are chasing after the wind. There's this lie that is being fed in selfish ambition, in pursuit of the world, into pursuit of whatever desires we have. If you get that job, if you get that promotion, if you get that salary, if you get that vacation, if you can just buy a house, if you can get that girlfriend or if you can get that boyfriend, if you could be just like so-so, if you could fill in the blank, all of this is a lie. And yet worldly wisdom will keep people enslaved by their wants. It will keep people enslaved by that selfish ambition and it wishes to never let them go. Selfish ambition is a slave master. And it wants to keep you. If you are not in Christ, it wants to keep you. And that's what it looks like to have worldly wisdom. Our third lesson. What is the wisdom from above? What is the wisdom from above? We're going to see this in verses 17 through 18. And lastly, what James is going to do is he's going to contrast worldly wisdom with the wisdom from above. Uh, one of the things that we, we look at in the student ministry when we do how to study the Bible is those transitional words. And so right there in verse 17, you have this big one. It's the word but. The word but. So James is he's putting these two things in contrast to one another. He says that you have the wisdom from the world, and then we're going to transition into the wisdom from above. So 
excuse me. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. In verse 18. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So James is now painting this picture of, okay, what does it look like to have wisdom from above? In our first lesson we saw, how do we weigh wisdom? How do we identify it? Where, where can we see wisdom in those who are around us? And he answered the question with, in their behavior. Who's, who is wise among you? Show me in your good behavior. And so next we're looking at this picture of what does it look like to have said good behavior? What does it look like to have said wisdom from above? And we're going to see that through these marks of wisdom from above. Marks of wisdom from above. So start, starting off, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure. It is first pure. Uh, and that, it's, it's, that's, the first one is set apart by itself. It, literally, it says, first pure. Uh, and, and so a lot of commentators take this to say, this is like the foundation for these marks of wisdom, this marks of wisdom from above. And it said it is, it is first pure. Uh, pure, that, that word, it, it has this understanding of something that is undefiled from anything. It is clean. Uh, the, word, it, 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 the word itself is the root word where we would get our word holy. So it is set apart. Since it is from above, one commentator sa- states that wisdom which is free from any stain or blemish, would be incapable of producing anything evil. Ultimately, he's saying that if, if this wisdom is from above, it is, if it is from God, if this wisdom is from God, it is perfect. It is not capable to have a blemish. It is not capable to be uh, muddied or mixed with another uh, kind of uh, selfishness, or maybe there's some wisdom and some selfish ambition. No, he's saying that wisdom uh, from above is first pure. It is undefiled. It is clean. And then he says, then peaceable. Wisdom from above is then peaceable. Peaceable, it has this understanding of being not combative, not combative or full of strife. Peaceable, uh, the word peace, you guys know this, uh, the best way that I have come to this understanding of, of peace is, is when I think about hippies and what they would say, hey, you know, peace, man, peace. We just need to live in world peace. And there's this understanding like what is world peace? And the, just the common understanding of what world peace is is that there's no war. That's, we, want, we don't want there to be any hostility or any war. But when we think about a biblical understanding of peace, there's similarities where a biblical understanding of peace is, is that there is no hostility, that there's no conflict. Peace would be the absence of conflict. And so uh, wisdom from above is first pure, and that it is peaceable. It is not combative. It's not full of strife. Uh, it's then gentle and reasonable. It's full of mercy and full of good fruits. It's unwavering, and it is without hypocrisy. All of these adjectives are painting a picture of a person who is understanding and mature in what they do. They are gentle and compassionate. The way in which a wise believer would walk would be that of someone who is gentle and compassionate. They are consistent in their life. They are unwavering. They are without hypocrisy. That means that you don't you don't see them talking and, and living a life over here in one way, and then you see them on a different day with a different group of people, and they're completely different. No. Someone who has wisdom that is from above is someone who, is, who has a, a life that is unwavering. It is without hypocrisy. They're consistent. In church, we know what this person looks like. They care about the Lord. They care about the things of the Lord. They care about the people of the Lord. This person would care about sanctification. They would care about the sanctification of others. When you see them, they are concerned for the things of the Lord. And the wisdom from above is, in fact, from above. It is from God. I want to remind you uh, of something that is said in chapter 1, uh, verse 5. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
in chapter one, James, James is, he's instructing the, uh, the believers that if you need wisdom, all you have to do is ask. And God, who gives generously, will give it to you. And, and then a little bit later on, he talks about how uh, if you ask, but you doubt, then you will not get it. And there's just this picture of, hey, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Why? Because it is God who gives wisdom. Why? Because wisdom, this wisdom, is from above. Proverbs 13, verse 10 says this, Through insolence comes nothing but strife. But, in contrast to that, wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Someone who is wise is someone who is most concerned about the Lord and the things of the Lord. And it is evident in their life. And then uh, James says this in verse 18. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Righteousness is produced by planters who are toiling in peace to make peace. Righteousness is produced by planters, those who sow, who are, who are working in peace to make peace. Peace not like that of a hippie, but like someone who longs for unity. Someone who longs for no hostility. One commentator says this, and I think this is a helpful point. The righteous do not merely keep the peace. The righteous do not merely keep the peace, which sometimes means failing to confront problems. That should be addressed. Rather, they make peace. The righteous make peace, which may mean temporarily disrupting in order to deal with the root problems. I think that's so helpful. When we think about peace, and if it's the, if it's the absence of conflict, then we might think, oh, well, then we can't, we can't do any conflict. And that's not what James is saying. He's saying sometimes for you to make peace, you have to, you have to confront. You have to confront falsehood. You have to confront things that are not right. It's not, oh, just hands off. I'm trying to keep the peace. Sometimes to make peace, you have to confront. It, it may mean temporarily disrupting in order to deal with the root problems. So that being said, wisdom that comes down from above is set apart. It looks righteous. It is righteous. What this looks like is a saint who walks around with godliness on, along their neck. They speak and they act in a way that shows that what they really want is for God to be worshipped. Someone who walks with wisdom longs for God to be worshipped. Imagine what it would look like if we walked around in this sanctuary, if we came to church, when we leave this evening, if we walked around and every person that you looked at in the face, you looked at them longing to worship God. That means when I, when, I, when, I, when I interact with any one of you, that my desire is to worship God. And my desire not only is to worship God, but is to speak to you in such a way that you worship God. That that is the, the root, that is the core, that is the thrust for which my interaction takes place. That I care so much about the things of the Lord that our interactions are going to be that of which uh, someone who is mature and godly and God-honoring would be doing. Imagine what that would look like. Imagine if every time you walked in this building, every time you interacted with any human in your life, that you looked at them wanting God to be honored. If we looked at every person with a desire to serve the Lord, imagine if you had no agenda outside wanting to serve, to encourage, to help to love. Church, your spouse, your family, your friend, your brother, your sister in Christ, wisdom from above is displayed in our good behavior and deeds done in gentleness. So that's our passage. Now, what I want to try to do is draw all this together. How do we, how do we connect all of this together? Remember what our timeless truth is. The source of your wisdom is evident in your walk. The source of your wisdom is evident in your walk. Wisdom of the world promotes oneself. If you have worldly wisdom, you are a self-promoter. Uh, but wisdom from above 
displays a life upright and good. If you are marked, if your life is marked by uprightness, by a good life, that your behavior is marked as wisdom from above, I want to think about a couple implications of, of how this affects us. A couple of implications of how this truth by itself will then affect or implicate our lives as we seek to live lives that are marked by heavenly wisdom and not worldly wisdom. And there's three. The first one is, we ought to long for wisdom. We ought to long for wisdom. I said it in the beginning, discipleship. Discipleship. Uh, one of my favorite announcements that is given every Wednesday in the student ministry is, hey, are you being discipled? Are you? And if you're not, hey, all the youth leaders, raise your hand. And, we, and, we, and every week this is being said, students, be discipled. The same goes for everyone in this room. We all need help. There, there's not one person in this room that doesn't need people in their life sharing truth with them, speaking truth into their life, and, and helping them to draw nearer to the Lord, helping them to see if there is any waywardness in their life, helping them maybe just to encourage them. Maybe instead of an older, older, younger, it could be, hey, you're trying to serve the Lord, and I'm trying to serve the Lord. Let's do this together. Let's, let's have a, a faithful friendship. Let's have a friendship that is intentional, that is marked by, hey, I'm going to speak things to you that I think need to happen or change, or I'm going to encourage you, and I want you to do the same. I want to live this life, and I want us to, 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 to wrap our arms around each other and walk in faithfulness. We ought to long for wisdom. We ought to. Right? What, what, what does James say at the beginning? Who is the wise among you? Let him show it. Prove it. Show, show that you are wise by your good behavior. Not show that you are wise because you know X, Y, and Z. Or you've memorized X, Y, and Z. We have been entrusted with so much truth. And I think there's, there's so many passages of scripture that we can go to. But just thinking through, what, is, what does Jesus say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? He says... The one who hears these words and acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. To hear these words of mine and act on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. What was the wise man? What did he do? He heard and he acted. How do we, how do we show that we are wise? Our lives. Our lives. Our lives should be marked by everything that was, that was given at that, at that last section. So number one, our first implication from this passage, we ought to long for wisdom. And it's not just discipleship. It's not just faithful friends. It's going to be coming to church, coming to men's group, coming to the men's conference, shameless plug for the ladies, coming to the, the women's groups that we have. It's coming to the women's conferences that we have. It's coming to all of the conferences that you're allowed to come to. It's coming to church every time the doors are open. Why? Because we want it. Because we want to be fed. We want to be equipped. We want to be encouraged. We ought to long for wisdom. And the reality is we're not going to get it from out there. The, the wisdom that we are talking about, it comes from above. Secondly, we ought to consider our words when we speak. We ought to consider our words when we speak. A couple ways that we ought to think through this is, is first, when we seek to give wisdom, if you are someone who is discipling people and you say, hey, here is how you ought to think through that or here is how you ought to apply that to your life, you ultimately are administering wisdom. And with that being said, if wisdom that is from above is pure and yet James in chapter 3 says the tongue cannot be tamed, we ought to speak and walk carefully. I'm not saying don't speak. I'm not saying, hey, you should be terrified and, and not ever open your mouth because what you're going to say is wrong. The, the, the point that's being communicated is that because we ought to pursue wisdom, because we ought to share and give truth and share wisdom, when we do so, that we would 
that we would measure, that we would weigh the words that are coming out of our mouths and that we would use intentionality. That's number two. Third implication, we should be thankful for the Bible. We should be thankful for the Bible. It is, it is an absolute gift that God has given it to us. Just a, one of the simple points in that, it is from above. It, the, the scripture is God's word. When we think about how we ought to live, there are, there are passage after passage after passage that not just equip, that not just build up, but then instruct in how it is we ought to walk, in how it is we ought to think, in how it is we ought to live. We should praise the Lord that he has given it to us and that he has not left us alone. That he gives us wisdom from above. And that we have these criteria to think through. I can imagine uh, recognizing that wisdom is important and recognizing that we ought to pursue it and recognizing that it's more valuable than gold and asking the question, then how am I going to get it? What am I supposed to do? And yet God, in his mercy and kindness and graciousness, has given us his word. And he has given us a church with faithful men and women who are seeking to grow up in this. All of us have faithful people in our lives that we watch. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we have faithful people that we watch. Guess what? You could be one of them. You could be one of those faithful people that people are watching. So when we think about wisdom, we must, we must value these things and and take these to heart. I want to talk about two people now. I had a seminary professor uh, in, at, at the Expositor Seminary that, I think set the bar for this, and um, uh, it's it's just a story that when I think about wisdom and I think about these truths being applied, it, this is one of the first things that come to my mind. And and here's why: the, this individual, his name was uh, Dr. Zimick, faithful man, and he was by far the most learned in the scriptures man that I have ever met. If I said, "Hey," Tell me about Psalm 76. He would say, oh, that's a great one. But there's that weird uh, phrase in there in verse 2 that kind of stands out. And I said, tell me about Amos chapter 1, verse 4. He'd say, oh, man, that's such a sweet verse. And, and just a man who, who is, he, if you cut him, he would bleed Bible. And, and just, he knew the truth. He loved the truth. He was, as a young seminarian, I was just intimidated by him. Because I, I felt like if I said good afternoon, I was going to say something wrong. Because he just, he could see into my soul. Because he knew the truth so well. Uh, and he was such an example of what it means to have truth and understanding and wield it with gentleness. And wield it with humility. And wield it ultimately with this desire to worship the Lord. Uh, I got to sit in a couple of his classes and one of them was a Hebrew preaching class. So this is, this is third, third, year, third, third year Hebrew. This is like the end of the road. And I remember sitting, and he was the proctor, and all of my classmates had to preach a sermon from the Old Testament using the, the Hebrew text. And I remember there would be times when a student would say something, and I would say, ooh, that's interesting. I wonder what he's going to say. Because you know, like, maybe, maybe they said something that, that wasn't completely communicated clearly, or it was, it was something that was potentially, it could have been contradicted somewhere else, or something that was just, that was not what you would have expected to hear. And I'm like, he's going to give it to him. And I remember every time, without fail, he would say, well done, brother. And, and, and he would have such encouraging things to say to this young uh, preacher, who is, this young man who is wanting to be a preacher. And I just remember that was... So the critiques that he was giving, the, the truth that we were learning was so impactful. But that man's example to my life spoke ten times greater. Now you have this guy who can, who is, I mean, he can dance circles around me in the Hebrew text. And, and everyone who I was sitting next to, 
and yet was so kind and so gentle and so encouraging with the truth that he was given because he knew that all his responsibility was to serve the Lord and that he wanted this individual to serve the Lord. And so he was going to encourage him and then later he would probably send him a letter or, you know, when he sent the, the actual documents, he might have in, instructed or he may have addressed those things. He didn't uh, let falsehood go freely, but he was just so gentle and so kind in that. And it stands out. It just, it, it was so impactful to my life that you have this man who was watching people just make mistakes and they were, they were simple mistakes and he was so gracious. I was thinking, that's, that's wisdom. That's a guy who knows the Lord. Another person, thankfully he's not here, so I can talk about him, Pastor Philip. <laughs> you guys are like, oh, here we go. Um, such a wise man. Uh, I, I remember, so uh, a lot of you guys may know this, some of you may not. Pastor Philip has been really the, the main spiritual influence in my life since 11th grade. So for more than 10 years, he has been the, the loudest spiritual influence in my life. And he has been... Um, so kind, and he has been so wise in the time that we have. And, and one of the things that comes to my mind is, is, is I would come to him, and th- I had an issue. There was just something that had to be fixed. And I remember being, like, frantic. This was years ago. And I felt like, we have to figure this out. Like, I don't know what's going to go on. Like, the world is going to stop spinning. There, there are huge issues. And he just so gently would, or, or even if, like, there are situations where, like, I would sin, and I'd be like, oh, here it comes, here it comes. And then he would, how are you? And, 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 and just would come alongside me so gently. And, and, and he would come, and he would shepherd me, but he would do it in a way that I didn't leave, like, with a limp. I didn't leave with, like, bruises on the back of my head. I left feeling like I had been loved and cared for and shepherded. And he, what he was doing is he was wielding the truth with skill. He was taking God's word and he was implicating my life and my sins and my heart and the things that I was struggling with. And he was doing it with skill. And that's wisdom. Both of these men, when I think about them, it, when I think about why it would be that they would act like this, what comes to mind is that they trust the hand of the Lord. They trust the hand of the Lord. For me, as I, when I was a, a much younger guy, and I'm thinking, "Oh, we gotta, you gotta give it to him. You gotta, you gotta lay the hammer. You gotta hit him with a stick." These men would say, "I know that the Lord is going to sanctify you. I trust that the Spirit of God that dwells within you is going to do what God promised that is going to do." And then I know my responsibility. These men never felt like the world was going to stop spinning if they didn't do something or say something immediately. And the things that they, they most care about is that they would be biblical and that they would worship God. When you think about wisdom, that's what it looks like. That you have truth, that you have understanding, but that you are wielding it in such a way that you are helping, that you are serving, that you are encouraging. Church, we would do well to long for wisdom. We would do well to long for wisdom. We would do well to love to receive wisdom. We should want that. It takes humility. I recognize that. It's hard. It's hard to say I don't have it all figured out. We should love that. We should love to receive wisdom. And we should live to walk in wisdom. Pray with me. Father, thank you for tonight and thank you for your word. Thank you for this church where we can come and be fed, where we can come and uh, encourage one another, where we can come and use our gifts. Thank you for the elders that you have given us who care for us and keep watch over our souls. Thank you for your word, God, that you have given it to us in such a way that it can shape our lives, that it can change our thinking, that it can uh, sharpen us as we seek to live for your name's sake. God, I pray for those uh, who are longing to be wise, that they would recognize where that's going to come from and that they would seek it, that they would live for it and that they would love it. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for saving us from our sin. Thank you for saving us from our selfish ambition and our self-worship. 
God, you are worthy of all things. And pray this in the name of your Son. Amen.